Diablo 4 arrives on Xbox June 6th. As the forces of hell gather, only you can stand in their way. Journey across the expansive open world of Sanctuary. Choose from five powerful classes to fit your playstyle. Adventure with your friends in four-player co-op with cross-play and cross-progression on all platforms. On June 6th, hell welcomes all. Pre-order Diablo 4 Ultimate Edition on Xbox and get up to four days early access. Rated M for Mature. New from the Fox News Podcast Network. I'm Emily Campagno, and this is the Fox True Crime Podcast. And I had nothing to do with her disappearance. I sit down with the people who lived the nightmares. I was in shock. I was just devastated. The investigators who tirelessly worked on the case. And I really hope that they can catch this guy. Bringing you closer to the story than you ever thought possible. Listen and follow now at foxnewspodcasts.com or wherever you get your podcasts. These are the stories that keep you up at night. Hey, what is up? This is the Man Fuse Podcast. Kay Lee here on video. First time ever. Ben H. on video. Loving it. I hope you guys enjoy this. We have moved into the world of video. So you can see us. The video realm. So today on the Man Fuse Podcast, our guest Craig Foster is going to educate us on why you should back off. If ever in an altercation with somebody wearing sweatpants that has no pockets... He's also going to detail for us how they were able to tape a dollar bill in a way that when inserted into a change machine, it would give the bill back while draining the change out of the machine. It sounds clever, but it ended up landing Craig in prison for 17 months and how that time shaped him into becoming a tattoo artist and turning his life around. He's also going to detail how he was shot in front of his apartment. So let's get into it. So I'm not even going to waste any time. We are going to get our guest on who is going to be on the phone. His name is Craig Foster. He is my tattoo artist, a dear friend. He was featured on Ink Masters many times. He tattooed you, Ben. He's the last guy that put ink on my body, too. So with no further wait, Craig Foster, how the hell are you? What's up, dude? Yes, sir. I'm good. You remember Ben H., right? My military buddy, handsome, dashing-looking fellow. Beautiful man. A beautiful man. <laughs> he um, he had a piece of shit tribal on his arm, and you brought it to give it to death. You did improve it. Yeah. You did. Yeah. yeah. There was an improvement. He now, brought I, out some I was, points. I was joking, actually, about it being a piece of shit. It, it wasn't bad at all. No, it's, not, it's not that bad. Oh, no, it no. It definitely needs a touch up. You know, uh, Craig yeah, might yeah. want to yeah, touch might. her up. I, wondered, I always wondered if we could do something different with it, but I think maybe it's too tribal. You can't really hide it. <laughs> you know what I'm hey, saying? Hey, you know what? Let's ask Craig the famous question that probably is his number one ick. Hey, Craig, what can you do with that? <laughs> do you even remember what it looks like? No. Why would I? And that's really Every fun. Day. Every, Every day. Every day. You're like, you better just start from new. And you know what's funny? So um, Craig and I go back to when I was 17, and I'm going to get into our first encounter. Mm. Craig is one of my dear friends. I consider him one of my best friends. Yeah. He has known me since I was just a lowercase g. Mm. And um, <laughs> But listening to Craig now, who owns his own shop, it's called Skinworks. Hey, Craig, can you give out your Instagram handle for everybody? Uh, the Skinworks, S-K-I-N-W-E-R-K-S. Couldn't have said it just, better. That's that's it. That's it. It's a great name. He doesn't even use the website, I believe, anymore because <laughs> all of his tattoos and all of his artwork go up on Instagram. Well, actually, if you were to Google skinworks.com, it actually takes you to a site that you can purchase Viagra. Oh, nice. <laughs> I, I always want to get a boner. Who doesn't? You try out Blue Chew. <laughs> Why does the site take you? to viagra it's like a, a google scam basically if, if if you're not paying google anything for your listing which you don't they they can hack into your site and screw up the search results now if you use like a different search engine other than google it would work out just fine but if you specifically use google which everyone does it literally brings you straight to a viagra well, site. so what they do they fuck it up crazy. first and then they contact you to tell you what's wrong with your site <laughs> and offer their services for five hundred dollars to fix it but you know what the end of the day there is a little light at the end of the tunnel it could be worse (laughs) you could like go to it and it could just be 
cock on cock, like some dude like 69ing another guy. That might Rough. be a little. How do you even think of something like that? Well, Ben, that's... I mean, the wild, wild. Well, I want to contact the Viagra company and see if I can work out some kind of promotional. I mean, oh, two like, old hey. guys 69ing each other is just something I would have never came up with. That is just way beyond. You know, <laughs> did I say old? Yeah, I, yeah, did yeah, I? Yeah. Did those words you come said out of two my mouth? old guys sixty nine? <laughs> <each other. laughs> well, one, one of those like real fuzzy looking commercials it like, where it looks yeah. all beautiful. Yeah, and it's just a man sitting on a bench with a boner just looking <laughs> out of his <laughs> Viagra. <laughs> Are you old? <laughs> Are you old and lonely? <laughs> Are you so low that you wear sweatpants without pockets? <laughs> <laughs> what, what's wrong with sweatpants without pockets? <laughs> it means you don't care about shit. You don't care about nothing. <laughs> so, so wait a second. You, you literally stop giving a fuck when you yeah, wear sweatpants. It's over. So if you have sweatpants... <laughs> That have pockets, you're okay. But as soon as you oh, say yeah, no, you're... I don't want pockets anymore. Well, those are pants. <laughs> sweatpants with pockets are pants. You see a dude with no pocket that... sweatpants on, and he's talking shit to you. <laughs> fucking leave him alone. Yeah, do not <laughs> fuck with that guy. <laughs> he, he's he got nothing to lose. Does not give a shit. He got... does not give two shit about he doesn't what even happens, have so. pockets yeah <laughs> jesus i i wasn't aware of that i i didn't really know that that was a sign that i should get the fuck out of dodge and, and protect my neck you never heard that saying no a, a man, man without that. pockets is a dangerous man N no there's I only just made one it level up, above I mean, that yeah. Whoa, what's level that above that is jorts <laughs> jorts because jorts have a bunch of pockets they're <laughs> yeah. like cargo pants and jeans yeah <laughs> got a blade in one so a so, grenade in another so i should be more worried about jorts than i should the man with no pockets no jorts just means you're lonely but you want <laughs> you don't want to be lonely <laughs> oh okay you're this is, lonely but you don't want it. this is really good information you have pockets to keep you company this is like subliminal <laughs> subconscious messaging that people like i wasn't aware so yeah. when someone comes up to me with no pockets and he's raising his voice i know that this has nothing to fucking lose, and I better just back off and just surrender. You know, where they... you got to be able to read that shit within two seconds. You don't even want their eyes to see your eyes search their pockets. Yeah. You don't want, you don't him... want them to know that you know that they don't have pockets. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta Once that they figure quick. that out, they're going to go into action. So check this out. Let's get back to a little history. Craig Foster, who has been featured on Ink Masters numerous times, one of the most talented artists I know. And I always, you know, praise you, Craig, because your work stands out. You know, I'm not an artist, but I've always told people I got a pretty good eye for art. And I worked with tattoo artists for damn eight years in a tattoo shop, you know, hanging out with you crazy motherfuckers fuckers and we know artists that you know will look at reference material and and you know they'll kind of copy from there and stuff like that craig has one of those minds where he can look at something once i feel like and he's pretty much got whatever style of that image is just going to come out of him and the speed that you draw is just really a gift and it's super impressive and you can recognize craig's work from a mile away yeah if, if i see somebody i'm like craig foster did your shit and i have people come up to me all the time craig foster did your shit yeah. yeah, yeah, I know. Craig Foster, <laughs> Craig Foster. But you got such a wicked style to you. And For I sure. and I I tell people all the time because I mean it happens the other day, a baseball tournament. Man, your color, man. Look at that. I'm like, yeah, my boy's like the modern day fucking Picasso. That's what I refer to you as, Craig. I don't know if you take that yeah, as a compliment. I'm, I'm blushing over here, Chris. Oh, are you? Could I tell that you were blushing? <laughs> Not really. Because <laughs> Craig is light skinned. Um, he's a handsome, light skinned black man, but I don't know that I would be able to tell if you were blushing. <laughs> now, by the grin on your face, I could tell you were happy. So I met Craig when I was 17. I went into Psycho Tattoo. I got pierced by this fellow tattoo artist slash piercer. Crazy white dude with big, thick dreads. His name was Barry. <laughs> Barry. And how I ended up getting my foot in the... Actually, so I think when I went up there, Barry pierced me. I smoked a blunt with him. I hit him up saying, I, like, during our blunt smoking session at the empty space next door to Psycho Tattoo, I guess that they had given... <laughs> 
Dino, the owner, the keys to let him store some shit in there. So we used to go in there and get high all the time. So that's where I'm smoking. Well, Barry, I'm like, Barry, man, I want to be a piercer. He's like, I'm pretty close with the owner. I can talk to him. And I believe in between that time and me actually coming in the day he told me to, I came in also to get tattooed. Now, I had paid. I was waiting. I wanted a big, <laughs> thick band. I had like a $350 budget. And you were running late that day. You were running late that day because you had just gotten out of jail. Oh. <laughs> for driving on a suspended license. Happens to all of us. And I remember you telling me, yeah, I got busted driving on a suspended license. So it wasn't any huge crime or anything. And I sat down with Craig and he drew up some custom Celtic shit on my arm. And, and you know, and we, we chatted it up. I thought we, you know, had a little bond. But it wasn't until I started working there that, you know, I really became close with Craig. And Craig also was the godfather to my son, Kai. I asked mm. Craig told Craig, if anything were to ever happen to me and my wife... Put him in the business. Put him... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, you and I worked together for what? It's It's been 20 years we've known each other now, I believe. Somewhere yeah, around that. Definitely. It's been a beautiful ride. We've done it all. I've, I've been tattooing 28 years now, so it has to be at least 26 to 27 years. Wow. I guess I wanted to touch on something because, you know, when I asked you to come on, and even before that, because you had been on my radar for a minute, I, I was thinking about all I know about you, which is a lot, <laughs> and we've shared a lot, and your story <laughs> continues to fascinate me. You know, and Ben, you probably don't know this about Craig. So Craig, I guess this was before you started tattooing, correct? When you were running around, uh, um, traveling from state to state, collecting money, I guess you'd yes, say? Yes, yes. So I'm just going to give Ben a little info and then I feel free to pick it up from here, Craig. So Craig and his friends had somehow figured out, Ben, hmm. that if they taped a dollar bill in a certain way, like a $20 bill, so they would fold it and they would tape it in a certain way, that they could insert it into any machine, Coke machines, vending machines, car washes. So if they put in a $20 bill, it would trick <clears throat> the machine into giving you $20 in coins and giving you your bill back. Come on. Okay, Correct. can I can I can I pick it up from there? Yeah. Am I wrong? No, no, you're not. But in 1990 or 91, because I used to go to Wheeler High School in Marietta, one of my friends learned this little trick and told me he was coming out to my house to show me something because he knew that I would appreciate it. And we went to a Walmart and he goes walking up to a Coke machine and he pulls out this dollar bill with tape on it and he puts it in the Coke machine dollar bill thing and then pulls it out. And then basically the machine automatically says that he has a dollar credit and then he pushes the soda. So that comes out 50 cent change and back then you know we're talking about 1990 uh sodas were 50 cents mm. oh my god <laughs> well they now so like i'm like 25. all intrigued like holy shit that was a cool magic trick and, and i think my buddy and i i guess the problem especially now now that i'm saying this out loud like talking about it because now i'm reflecting back on my youth most normal people like it would just stop right there get a free soda and that's funny and then that's it um me that but not you craig no 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 uh, we we literally would go to hotels that would have like 10, 15 floors and thinking, okay, well, this each floor is going to have a Coke machine on it. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> just go to the top floor and just hit every single Coke machine. And, and understanding this, like I knew that there was like $18 in quarters uh, per machine. So basically whatever place that we would go to, depending on how many floors it had, that's how much work it took to get that money. Get the dollar credit and then hit refund and it would drop the quarters. Is that the deal? It, de it depends on the machine. So like okay. really older machines, whatever, yeah. like, no, you had to buy the soda. But then there right. were some like newer machines, like, nicer machines like you would just hit change machines it would give you four quarters back god so but you ended up with a lot no, of coke was there a drink no of machine choice had more than 18 dollars in quarters really like at that all was the limit that's how much change quarters that a machine would hold was 18 dollars in quarters okay so from there we started thinking like well shit like all this work that it takes to get 18 dollars out of the machine if we took this same idea and put it towards a change machine like that would change it and so like it big basically time. took about a year and one of our friends basically bought if you go to car washes i'd say most car washes that have change machines there's three different makes of a change machine so the most popular one is a company called hamilton and hamilton 
they probably had machines at about 70% of all car washes. And that was the first machine that we figured out how to do mm. was a Hamilton machine. So you could literally go to a machine and clean out like 400 to $800 within like an hour and a half. Wow. So, and, and that's kind of fast forward to none of us had jobs. All of us lived in an apartment in Marietta and we would just go on road trips um, and just clean out. And get um, thousands of dollars, right? And just yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah do really well and then unfortunately like i'm i'm just one of those people who i get caught but i was like dedicated to my friend so basically i would take a lot of the heat because i was probably one of the only friends in my group that had a record so it was just an easier outcome for like i'll i'll say i did it because i literally didn't care about my record and then my friends would like kind of help me get out of it like paid bond or whatever blah 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 see normally isn't it the opposite i'd feel like because if your boys didn't have the record obviously you would go away if your record was bad enough where they would be a first time offender but you had your boys back to be like i'll take it well not really so basically it, it was like if i had a record and they didn't have a record they could basically say that they didn't know what i was doing okay and they would have to be let go immediately gotcha so it would just be less complicated Right, right. If right. only one of us was incarcerated, then like all of us together. So you were the designated fall guy. Uh, I don't think that that's how it all. It's not like we spoke about it and that's what happened. It's just whenever something bad would happen, I wouldn't want my you would activate to get in trouble. So I would just kind of, you know. I Take did that. it. <laughs> I had boys like that growing up. I've been saved a number of times by friends of mine who have in situations where we were all busted a couple times in the army, different things, you know, and, and uh, one stepped up and just was like, hey, it's this is on me. The whole thing it was my idea. I had the stuff. I did this. I did that. These guys didn't even want to participate. It was me. Right. <laughs> You know what I mean? No, but I mean, it was just, you know, that was just a thing. I think the last time that I got in trouble, me and a, a friend, we were in St. Louis. It was probably the most that I ever got caught with in St. Louis. And we're talking change. Uh, yes. I mean, quarters, was, whatever. Yeah, it was quarters. Uh, so basically the car wash that we went to the night before the car wash was uh, vandalized. Hmm. And basically the owner was staked out watching the car wash. Hmm. And so we pull up scan the area don't see anybody it was like snowing up and uh, it was like in st louis like the suburbs and we start hitting it and then within like 30 minutes of hitting it i noticed a truck that was sitting across the street and it yeah. looked like there was a person in it so immediately all, always our plan if something seemed off we would split up one person with the car would drive off and the other person on foot would carry all of the evidence which would be the bills right and the cash and the quarters and that's what i did i was the one on foot so my friend got pulled over because the guy obviously called the police when they pulled him over they didn't find anything except for my wallet so my id was in the car Ooh. dang so they immediately arrested him on suspicion that there was a second party on foot and then they ended up finding me probably about two hours later where uh, were just you like, i was just randomly walking because that was like always a plan like once we get off the scene the other person would just kind of drive around and look for you we had like pagers back then um, <laughs> yeah i always yeah, wondered that's... like you know when you run like where do you run to like you can only stay well, in the woods. Well, so and long. you're not in uh, you're the you know? state you live in either. Right. And it's, you know, well, I had a pager. So basically, whenever the coast is clear, he could like page me from the payphone. Right. And be like, hey, well, would you be you like at? in a ditch or like in under a culvert? <laughs> or... just, just walking, you know, and I could yeah. find a payphone and call him back. I had a bunch of quarters. Yeah, uh, yeah right. Yeah, you yeah. could call <laughs> you all you the could call yeah, international right. and just stay there. You could probably go to the airport. <laughs> You're right. So I, I hid the money and the police came and picked me up and they took me in. Probably within two hours of me you hid being the at money. the police station. Well, I did hide it, but it was snowing. So like they in the woods? were able to track my footsteps and find the money. Oh. Mm -hmm. You left a clear indication was, of where yeah. you've been. So I want to just say that this is a clear, whether you believe in God or the universe or whatever it is, some people <laughs> are just meant to be caught so that they can change their ways and go a different direction that, in life. And I'm not sure if that happened to you after this, Craig, but were you telling me it this did. story, that was, that, that you were the meant to be caught ever, here, you know? I was, yeah. definitely. So if you get arrested in St. Louis, they have a system called gumbo. Gumbo is a a facility Jambalaya. that they they hold you there until you go to court oh that's, that's the um, worst and so i've been incarcerated quite a bit and that hands down was the 
most dangerous, serious jail that I've ever been in. The St. Louis And I want to say, yeah, mostly because they had to separate gang members from Chicago from gang members in St. Louis. Oh, yeah. You were either on one side or the other. And Ooh. if you weren't on either side, you were just kind of you casual. Know, it was just dangerous. Yeah, you were so, up for recruitment <laughs> from either side. My buddy that came with me, he was a white guy. And Jesus, I, what was that? I, I couldn't take him out of my sight the whole time that we were that we were in there like basically if i left his side for like one second um he would basically be in trouble and i would have to like step in and be like he's with me you had to like claim him like the fact that he was white he had very little social currency exactly so and i'm explaining this because basically that was their tactic whenever they started questioning us about what we did and what charges because obviously they did not know how the money was removed from the car wash. And there was no evidence supporting what we were doing to get the money out. So basically they needed us to admit to it and explain to them. And so basically that was always our upper hand when doing yeah. this stuff that they have no idea of how this money got out. So basically right. the easiest way was basically to say that you put a dollar in and all of the money, it was a malfunction on the machine's part. So basically your charge goes from a felony theft to misdemeanor theft by receiving. Ah, that's Which is right. helpful. That's pretty sly though. Like, yeah, because nobody... At this point, nobody is on to what you guys know. No, they, they, there was no way for them to understand. Basically, you have money and the machine's missing money, but <laughs> they have no clue on how you got the money out of the machine. And there's no evidence of you breaking anything. Or, there's, or... there's no break-in. There's no evidence of tampering. Like, it's just... Magic. Uh, have you ever seen David strange Copperfield? Charge. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, and, they, and most it's most places just physics. don't know how to deal with it. So basically what they did, they got him, separated us, and basically he admitted to everything. They told him, you don't have a record. We know the situation. You're with this guy. He's a lot of trouble. He has a record. Why don't you tell us what happened, and we will let you go nothing. And so basically he admitted that we took the money out, but he didn't tell them how. He basically just got it to get out, which to this day I don't have any animosity because he was – literally in danger every single day it was kind of difficult to watch him kind of try to navigate through that system just because he was white that he was in danger so you knew he was going to just be like whatever you need to know i just need to get the fuck out of here um, well i i didn't know that that's what happened. they just separated us and basically i learned like three days after we were separated that he had been freed wow um yeah but they still didn't get you on the felony right because they no, so basically after they freed him, that became my alibi. Well, you guys just let go of the the guy that was doing it. <laughs> <laughs> right? He's the I ringleader. Yeah, yeah. He told you that just to get out. So, like, I'm literally, I was sleeping in the car when all that happened. I had no idea what happened. So that was my story. I stuck to it, and they ended up keeping me for four months. You um, served four months. I sat there for four months. Damn. And we, I think the first time I went in, they offered me three years. I turned it down. Second time, one year, turned it down. The last time, it was basically just probation. Uh, get the fuck out of here. And I took that and I left. So they gave me probation. I left. But when I came back to Georgia, I had violation of probation for getting arrested. Ooh. So basically, I got picked up on that probably about five months after I came home. And then basically I did 17 months on that, which was another car wash in Marietta. But that... It was literally three dollars. I got three dollars out of a car wash. It had it, there was a a way that they could limit how much money you got out of a car wash. That was literally the only fix for it. So if you came to a car wash, and it might still be like that today, if you got fifteen dollars out, it would stop taking one dollar bills for every two minutes. Every two minutes, a one dollar credit would come back. Mm -hmm. So under any circumstances, if someone came up and tried to get sixteen dollars in ones, it would stop immediately after five after 15 and then every two minutes you could get another dollar hmm. so, so i think like under normal circumstances the machine would never pause didn't you get caught with the tool no i never got caught with the tool you never got caught with the tool i could have sworn never. like in in all of our banter back and forth that so you ended up serving 17 you, months you're versed in weed do you remember that place this that and the other <laughs> of course i love that place so this that and the other used to sell these these safes to put weed in Right. Um, they would like literally be like a WD-40 can. Right, of course. Or something like that, and you would unscrew the bottle. So that's what we used to keep the bills in. 
Uh-huh. And like a water bottle, never, they make water bottles. Well, uh-huh. we specifically had a gunk and it was gunk engine cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> and basically it would always have like three legitimate cans of gunk engine cleaner. And then one was a safe that we kept the bills in uh-huh. and never did they ever find the bill. Wow. That's um, crazy. So did you do 17 months in like, the county or did you go to prison well that was prison so basically i got caught for three dollars it was a felony but basically there was no evidence and i never admitted to it so basically all they could get me for was misdemeanor theft by taking but the prosecutor was really pissed off about that and so basically he took my misdemeanor and turned it into the state and so majority of all inmates in, in the prison system are called felons right you're, you're are you familiar with that? Yes. So basically felons are basically they're people charged with felonies. I had a misdemeanor. So basically I was one of, I think the whole time that I was incarcerated, I met one other person with a misdemeanor and I can't remember Damn. what his specific charge was. But basically instead of having an EF number, I had an EM number. It was mm. an earned misdemeanor. They gave- I did 17 months. The day before my release, St. Louis who was never notified that I was picked up on violation probation charge, put a hold on me, and they basically came to the system, picked me up, and I was extradited from Georgia God. all the way back to St. Louis. Oh, uh, for on what? A, a right for violation probation. Uh, oh. My violation probation was for getting arrested in St. Louis, so I didn't technically get another charge, but St. Louis didn't know that. Right. Basically, they just saw that I'd never reported to the probation that they put me on, and so they put a hold on me. Dang. And, and they extradited me back to St. Louis. The day before I, you were going to get out. Right. Oh, my God. So I remember at that time, it was two officers. They looked like FBI agents. I don't know what they were, but basically they took me on a private plane from Albany, Georgia, all the way to Atlanta. And then basically I boarded a commercial flight in Atlanta to fly back to St. Louis. I was sitting in the back seat and I remember the pilot had to announce to everyone on the flight that there was a prisoner being (laughs) being extradited sitting in the back and for no one to speak to me. So of course, everybody on the plane had to go to the bathroom to look at the prisoner in the back. Um, Did you get head? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it'd be it awesome if a girl came back there and she was like hey god i'm gonna suck your dick i just but always I, I will say like if this hadn't happened to me i still have doubts that i was done with getting in trouble at right. that point so that was like the end of it so, to me i was just like i'm, I'm fucking done which, getting in trouble which shit. i thought about that too which is amazing that you were that much in the system Because I don't care if you're black or you're white. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, being black and I I can't relate to this, but I hear uh, I hear it from you and and, and other friends of mine that, you know, you guys have to deal with racism at a whole different level. Like when you're getting pulled over by a cop, you've even had to instill some wisdom to your son because of that kind of fear. You hear it all the time. But anybody that gets into the systems could be a struggle to get the fuck out. I would think. No, nah, it, it's true. It is. I mean, it's, it's difficult. Like I said, like if I hadn't have been extradited and had more stuff to deal with, I don't think that I was fully ready, settled on what I wanted to do. You probably were like, I'm about to get out and I'm about to go get some money and I'm about to go do this and I'm about to go do that. Well, I was tattooing. That's why I started tattooing in the Georgia system. And how did you make your machines in order to tattoo? Out of radios. Wait, you made tattoo machines out of radios in prison? So basically, if you, you can buy a, a tape player like a Walkman okay. on the store commissary. So if yeah. you take that Walkman and take it out, there's a, a motor that's inside it. So basically you would just buy a Walkman and take the motor out. And then you go to the band room, which they had a band room. You get an E-string, which is, it's like a hard wire that has more wire wrapped around it. So right. it's like one of those really thick bass strings. Yeah, yeah. And you unravel that that wire and the hard wire that's in between it. That's your actual tattoo needle. Okay. And then uh, it's just, I, I literally, I could make one right now if i wanted to like you just get a pen just a simple rotary tattoo machine powered by batteries 
That's um, wild. Isn't dude. that wild? But, yeah. But that's what I was doing. So at that point, that was my plan. Now, let's say if, if I hadn't have gone back to St. Louis, I probably would have uh, done change machines to try to earn money to get into tattooing. Gotcha. But by the time I got back to St. Louis, that definitely was not. And so uh, how long were you held in? How long were you in St. Louis? So for 30 days. Okay. Got so it. basically I, I went to St. Louis and once I got a court case, so my probation, the way it worked, it was called three years probation with a one year backup. So basically if you violated that probation, you would have to serve a year. Dang. That's so basically I was insane. being brought back to St. Louis to serve a year for violating that probation. And so the day before I went to court, I had a probation handbook that basically just kind of gave you your rights as a, I don't know if you understand, but probation, it's still a prison sentence or a jail sentence. It's just limited that you're not in jail. Right, got it. You're not physically in jail, but anybody on probation or parole, you're literally incarcerated. Yeah. They're just letting you not be take up in jail. space you're not taking up space but in the you don't have any rights whatsoever wow if you're on probation or, or parole so basically i had this handbook that literally told me what rights i do have which aren't many <laughs> and the one right that i did have it said if you were extradited from another state it's a judge's discretion to give you time served on the time that you serve in another state so i just got done doing 17 months mm -hmm. so when i went to court at a pro public defender and i showed him what it said in the book and he said he's not going to go for that and i said well the fuck can you, you ask? <laughs> yeah, just just ask him. Ask yeah. the judge, and it's, it's the judge's discretion. He's like, well, there's no way he's going to go for it. And I said, well, it, it, you're my public defender. I'm just asking that you ask the judge. And so he went and asked the judge, came back, and said the judge wants to see you in his quarters. And so I went in. The judge sat me down. Uh, it was I still remember it to this day. He like pulled out a Bible, and then he prayed for me. After he prayed for me, he said, so I'm going to go ahead and agree to sign this on a condition. And I said, okay. He said, you will never come back to the state of Missouri ever again. Wow. And, Dang. and I was like, can you elaborate on that? <laughs> and he said, well, if you have to go past Missouri somewhere, go the long way around. Wow. If you step foot in Missouri ever again and I find out about it, you will be incarcerated and you will be forced to serve that year. Ooh. And I was like, so how long does that last? He's like forever. Ooh. So to this day, I'm still not allowed in the state of Missouri. Do you think that judge is still alive? Probably I mean, not. judges make good money, so I would think he probably is. <laughs> right? <laughs> so you agreed. And yeah, I agreed. And they literally let me go. Um, oh, fuck. So yeah, that's no, crazy. no charges, no nothing. And, and I basically took a bus from St. Louis back to Georgia. Wow. And, and literally within a week, uh, I got a job at a tattoo studio. So, and that's unbelievable. So being in pr jail and... <laughs> learning how to tattoo, I would imagine you become pretty popular and probably that's a good currency because people are probably trading you whatever they have for tattoos, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. I never had to worry about anything. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of protection. So the system that I went to, it was called Calhoun CI. So just for people who don't know about the Georgia corrections. So basically, if you're given a sentence that you have to go to prison, you first go to a place called Jackson. Um, Jackson is a penitentiary that's located in Jackson, Georgia. Uh, you basically go there for close to three months. It can be a month to three months. But basically, you do diagnostics. They do testing on you, figure out what your education level is and basically what threat you are as far as like what kind of employment you can get while you're in there. So basically, if you're threat to like run away then obviously you cannot do anything outside outside the jail but then if you're not a threat and you're cool basically you can have like a job where you're not supervised which is what i got while i was in there so yeah they were trying to figure out like where you would fit in job wise right so when i went through diagnostics i was like the highest level of no threat, if that makes sense. I'm a lover. Like, yeah, like they, 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 I, I'm in there on the misdemeanor. Like my maximum time was a year. But like I said, the, the prosecutor pulled a lot of strings to make me do more than a year because basically I had a year time for my misdemeanor charge and then I had like eight months left on probation. So basically I agreed to take the misdemeanor if they ran them both concurrent. Right. Well, the prosecutor held on the probation time until I got to the finish line of the year and then he turned in my probation time on top of that, adding more time what a prick. onto it. Uh, well, yeah, I right. mean, the prick was me because basically <laughs> I was the one. You're the prick. That, 
Yeah, I, yeah. I basically beat his charges that he wanted to get. He was trying to get a felony on me, and I kind of uh, got, got right. by on him. Yeah. So he got by on me in the end of that. But anyways, the, the jail that I went to was called Calhoun CI. It was a brand new facility built. And when I went there, there were 15 inmates all together. Wow. And this is a whole prison. And they were all brand new CEOs. And by the time I left, there were like close to 1,800 inmates. Dang. So I was kind of like established OG as the the beginning of the system before it got populated. One of the first. Yeah, you were like the yeah, ringleader. There was one other tattoo artist, and that was the guy that kind of helped me uh, get my start in there. This guy named William Knott. But basically, this kind of sums up. Well. That's awesome. And and I think it's too. cool to point out that your dad served in the military, right? Yes, in the Air Force. Your brother served in the Air Force, right? <laughs> yeah, at that time, my brother went in and like, he was definitely full and, throttle, and uh, probably Desert Storm by that and time. And your dad is a pretty, uh, I didn't grow <laughs> up with him as a dad, but he's a pretty stern, he's an Air Force guy, he's a military guy, he's pretty strict, yes. right? Pretty stern. I was the black sheep. You were that. the black sheep. Yeah, well, totally. And so you have a brother named Chris, which Ben, this is kind of cool because I have a brother named Craig. Seely. <laughs> yes. Seely. Kaylee and Seely. But, you know, Kaylee is my alter ego. It's really Chris, which is really unique. Now, your dad, when you got out, how did he deal with you being in prison for 17 months? Was he just like, well, you got to pay your dues because this is all your fucking fault? I don't remember us being super close during that time because basically when I came out of that whole system, I definitely was very headstrong in the fact that I was going to be a tattoo artist. And he didn't um, like that. No, that that wasn't. We're talking about 1995. So it's funny. I was watching the Chicago Bulls versus the New York Knicks, and there was a game in 1995, and there was not one visible tattoo on the whole floor. I was watching this on uh, Classic ESPN the other night. That's pretty cool. Like if you think like about this is before this is before Rodman. I mean, Rodman to me was like one of the first like heavily tattooed basketball players back then. But right, right. That was right. that was before Rodman was on the team. So I was watching this game, and there was not one visible tattoo on the floor. So tattooing was definitely still uh, right in a shroud of mystery. You know, right? Yeah, it was illegal in in a bunch a number of places as well. You could South Carolina and New York were still illegal back then. So your dad wasn't really thrilled with your career choice. And even later on, he still wasn't thrilled for quite some time before accepting it, right? And being like... It took him two years to just take it serious. I want to say working at Psycho, it was like my first full working year at Psycho. Like I had passed over $50,000 that year. Right. And so... Basically, when I passed fifty thousand dollars in a year, that was like the first time that my dad kind of paid attention to it. It was like, okay, he like, can support himself. Yeah, right. I don't know what my dad pictured before that, but I guess he <laughs> sucking dick for money and tattooing. Yeah, <laughs> just burgers, hanging man. out, fucking just drawing tattoos on people and people just so, smoking and, and whatever. But Craig, let me know, ask Dean, you, Let me ask you this real quick, man. Do you have any? Sure. Do you have any uh, photos or any record or anything of the any of these? prison tattoos that were done with the Walkman radio as like yeah. reference. No, I don't. I mean, cause there's people out there today walking around with these tattoos. Yeah, they are with Craig's. I mean, I, Walkman I personally, tat. so when I came home, I was trying to get a job at a tattoo studio. So I was doing tattoos out of my apartment. Must have hurt. And so oh, I man. definitely yeah. have friends who have those first tattoos that I still speak with to this That's day cool. that got tattooed with, uh, with uh, the Walkman. A homemade walk. I literally, I came home and made one. That shit must have hurt. Was it worse than like a regular? I mean, it had to be, right? Because it's like, it's just a needle. And what well, kind of things did you draw, though? I mean, was it, could you draw anything? Nah, or was it so just like it, words it, and letters? If you think about it, like the, the Walkman tattoo machine definitely had less power than the actual easily voltage supplied like right yeah tattoo machine yeah. so it's probably easier okay but it just took a lot longer because there weren't like needle configurations and stuff like that you had like one side needle you, you were li limited to one needle right, right. like yeah. that's it like it was just a, a single needle and there's still people to this day that do single needle tattooing but it, it's a very tedious process so very, it doesn't hurt as much but it takes a lot longer it's very fine lined <laughs> right yes, yes. interesting so to me that's just an amazing story so you get a job at psycho 
our paths cross, we become great friends. <laughs> Craig, you know, was like a big brother to me. He gave me hard <laughs> lessons throughout the years. You know, Fuck your ear up. <laughs> fucked my ear up. I have damage, actually, <laughs> to my ear. Permanent damage to my upper <laughs> cartilage because of this man. Um, I remember getting my ear pierced and I pierced my cartilage with a ring and I was wearing this gross beanie and then Craig and I were wrestling and he put me in a headlock and like drug my head across the carpet. Oh my God. And like the next thing you know, my ear blew up. Oh no. I was in the hospital. I, I had to have it drained. Do you, you remember? Right, hey Craig, do you remember? Totally I think you it was- shit in jail. So I had just started piercing and I've said it before, but this is when the trend, like I got got in at this shop that was became one of the busiest shops in yeah. all of Atlanta. Yeah. And the trend exploded. Exploded. And I mean, it was like I was a rock star. Yeah. I mean, you remember Paula? Paula! <laughs> It was like the first chick I ever banged. Oh, no. All right, from and there. And her name was Paula? <laughs> <laughs> Did she talk like that, Paula? Sounds like an old fucking no. Jewish guy. You, she New probably, Jersey. not Pauly. <laughs> Paula. Pauly was the first man that ever banged me. You know what I remember? I remember she used to come in and you guys would make out. And I guess like Russell, and this is the owner's brother who managed the studio. Who was gay. And, and was the owner's Russell gay was, brother. <laughs> he was old school gay. Like he was like old literally school like, gay. oh, he was like the equivalent of your grandmother that was like an ex He like, was a he little was, bitch. He had to deal with a lot of shit growing up. So oh my God. He got beat up a lot. Russell, Russell did not like. Real you making out with your girlfriend so he had tom rest in peace tom because tom's not with us anymore right his but gay tom, his lover <laughs> tom was the most inconspicuous like you would not know in the closet like he looked like a plumber yeah uh, beard you know just and tom came in one night and they made out in the front and we were like <laughs> oh my God. what are you doing and dino and he was just like and what's the difference between chris doing it and me doing it oh that is <laughs> and then and then his brother who owned the shop found out and screamed at him do not be doing that gay shit in my front of my shop so russell hey, he russell was so funny. oh listen I'm so Ru hilarious. russell he was just like the biggest bitch sometimes i liked russell what was the story craig with the straight guy wait that russell turned this guy you talking about works buddy works what, Wirtz what? <laughs> his little homie because works was living with russell so we had a guy uh, that was living with russell not because he was gay but just because he needed a place to stay no 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 because he was a loser because he's a loser <laughs> 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 Remember, like his wife, like kicked him out or something. So right, he was he was working front counter for us, and Russell. So he went gay for a roommate, No, so. no, no. So the guy brought his friend over because yeah. he was his living best there. friend from his childhood. Best friend from childhood came and hung out. And at the end of the night, he didn't know where his friend was, and he heard noise in the friend's room. And so he opened the door, and Russell, Russell was, like, was banging him. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Oh my God! Can, can you imagine? His buddy told me he was experimenting. Yeah, his buddy. <laughs> gotta try it at least buddy. once. How do you know you like it till you try it? That was probably Russell's <laughs> argument. Russell was probably like preying on the dude's weakness. Like hey, he, dude. he, his buddy could have easily like plead the fifth and be like, I was drinking or whatever. But no, he just says like, no, I was experimenting. Dude. So I mean, the amount of stories we just don't even That's have time hilarious. to the amount of no, stories and funny shit that went on so fast forward a bit you and i you were dating somebody seriously you had already had a daughter you weren't with the the baby's mama and you broke up with her name was christy i believe right yes yeah. okay. and so, now the first few years of me working with you you were it was like you were married you weren't going out you weren't hanging out i was the young buck but as soon as you got single it was like my best my my club buddy appeared and all of a sudden <laughs> Craig and I are hitting every club every night of the week. You guys are famous. We're yeah, oh was, my god, we were crushing. It was Monday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, we are Saturday night, so, Sunday night. Oh my god, we were crushing. We we're we we're rolling our balls off. I mean, so many stories, oh so god. many epic <laughs> nights that we would just go out. And it was like you found this newfound freedom. You were a faithful guy to who you were committed to. But once you were done. 
you were done. And it was like, you got your own place and we're just kicking it That's amazing. nonstop. And so one night there used to be this club that we would frequent on Wednesday nights. They would have a wet t-shirt contest. It was called Ballyhoos. It was in this spot on Shambly Tucker in the shopping center, but everybody from all areas converged on this one huge nightclub. Yeah. And we ran shit there. We, we like, everyone knew us. We, you know, they got tattoos, they got piercings. We were, we're kind of rock stars. Anyway, a previous night in Buckhead, which used to be the hot spot too, I believe you had started talking to your now wife, Sky. Right at that point, yes. Mm-hmm. Was she she wasn't living with you? No, she was not. But she was at your house. She didn't come out with us that night. We went to my buddy, rest in peace, Philip PP. We called him PP because he peed in a girl's mouth one time, and oh, it was just right. epic story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> we got to give him his credit where it's due, right? So, Philip had tried to jack some dude's wallet, or he had gotten in a, an altercation with this. He got in an altercation, and the dude tried to rob him. But this wasn't at Ballyhoo's. This was at, at This was Chili like Peppers the week Buckhead. before at a different club. And Buckhead tried to, like, take his money. So, Philip came and got me and, like, just tried to rob me. And if you knew Philip, there was always, like, a 50-50 chance that he might be responsible. For it. Right. You wanted to have his back, but he might be the faulty prop well, of the party. You you just had to like figure out exactly like you had to see, like you had to investigate before you got fully involved with any of Philip's problem. Right. And so when Philip said it, I was like, come on, I'll go with you, confront him. And so when Philip saw the guy, he pointed him out, and that's him. And I'm like, well, go ahead and confront him. I got your back. And Philip said, why'd you try to take my money? And then it said, what are you going to do about it? Because it didn't know that I was with Philip. And so that confirmed that Philip was telling the truth. So I think basically was gonna have Phillips back at that point and then it was like kind of moving in talking Phillips and so then I moved at the guy like from the side and the guy like kind of looked and saw that I was with Philip, and the guy like backed off and like left fast forward two weeks later we're we were us. at Ballyhoo's and I saw that guy watching the group that we were with and that was back then it was like me you I mean we would always have like a group of like 10 people we had a crew hanging out and I remember like he was like watching us and then we had a couple of friends that were like wanting to go over there and I kind of got the feeling like the guy's like carrying a gun and so we went and got the bouncers the bouncers like got the guy kicked him out and then the following week was when the incident happened so Craig left the club we parted ways well we saw him there right didn't we have him removed from the club that was a week that was a week before so i never even saw him that last night so craig we part ways we've been rolling our balls off all night craig drives home i don't remember if we drove together i don't remember if no we didn't i was by myself you by yourself we go our separate ways craig gets out of his car you tell the story from here craig i'm pulling into my neighborhood i have like a security gated neighborhood and my pet peeve is when people try to like zip through behind you when you go through your security (laughs) gate right and so this who was following me he like tried to get through the gate and i like stopped short (laughs) so that the gate would hit his car (laughs) and he sped around me and stopped right next to me and that's literally the only reason why i remember like i had a description of his car because we kind of had like the stare down but he had tinted windows so i couldn't see inside the car and then i pulled off pulled into my spot right below my apartment and I noticed that the car who tried to speed him behind me parked a little further down the street. And so I remember sitting in my car and just like kind of watching. And then I kind of assumed maybe there's someone who lives here that just got home. Like they were possibly like leaving the same club that I left and then immediately just didn't think anything else about it. And so I'm like walking towards my house and then basically I just noticed two figures like approaching me. I was probably about 30 feet from my uh, staircase that led to my apartment. But I, I remember very clearly that I did not have any concern like i never thought that there was any malicious right intent the, the way that they were approaching me so i literally just stopped and just like kind of like looked at him like oh that's weird and then as he like came walking up to me he like hit me in the face with the gun it was like a it was a oh. 40 caliber dang um it wasn't like a polymer so it was definitely like a full metal like yeah. it was like a solid pistol he hit me in the face with it so when he hit me he was like give me your money and i think the first hit it was hard but 
it more confused me. Like, I don't think that at that point that it was even registered that I'm being like robbed. Right. It was more like somebody just like walked up and accidentally hit me in the face. Right. And that's kind of where my concern was at. And I remember like looking at him and I felt my face and I'm like, why'd you just fucking hit me? And then he hit me a second time on the top of my head with the gun. And I remember the second hit was the first time that I felt the first hit. Like, I guess it took a couple of seconds for the hit to even register. Right. So my, my hands went up and then the guy got behind me. There was a second guy that was like standing there and the guy was like going through my pockets. And then I guess he had pulled like $3 from like my <laughs> left pocket. Once he pulled the money out, he told the guy that the money was in my other pocket. And I remember at that point, the second guy had already backed up maybe about five feet by the time I paid attention to him. And it looked like he was just like walking backwards, like something wasn't going right. So I'm assuming that they had planned to just come up and knock me out and rob me was what the plan was. But after the second hit and I hadn't gone down, I think that everything just started kind of going sideways. So the guy hit me a third time on the very back of the head. And I remember the third hit was, it was just like a, it caused a reaction. And I remember just like kind of turning and grabbing a guy, like trying to do some Bruce Lee type shit <laughs> on TV. Right. You know those videos <laughs> where the memes, like it shows a guy telling you what to do. Right. Yeah. Like in a situation and then they show someone else trying it and they're in heaven. Yeah, right, and that's right. literally exactly what fucking happened. Like I tried to do some Chuck Norris, like I'm going to smack his hand and take the gun and then turn it back on him and say right. some like gangster, like Arnold Schwarzenegger shit. And I ended up getting shot. Yeah. Um, so you got so shot in the, in the hip or in the stomach? The, yeah. Through my right side. Uh, it went through my right hip, went through L5 of my spine oh. and then hit the other side of my hip and stopped. Wow. But I'll tell you what, the, the hit like a 40 caliber a bullet, bullet on close dude. range it, it laid me down and you had to crawl <clears throat> you had to drag yourself up your steps and try to well, and knock on the door right and do, let's the most difficult thing about getting shot with a 40 caliber is your brain does not comprehend the amount of force behind a bullet like you don't you should see like a truck hitting you or something like that right so it was like really disorienting um as soon as i like figured out that i got something hit me i like stood up and i didn't know i got shot and the guy like left and i remember like walking up like a couple of steps and then i started getting like wet and i started like looking at my clothes like thinking like man this guy like threw fucking liquid on me like oil or something and then i noticed that i was like bleeding like really bad dang and so i remember like lifting up my shirt and just seeing the actual gunshot was when shock like set in because like, it was just like a, a thumb sized hole in my side that blood was like pumping out. Wow. As soon as shock set in, I couldn't walk anymore. I couldn't breathe. And I managed to like use my hands because my legs weren't really working. And I got all the way up to the top. And so Sky, my wife, which this was, <laughs> this is like my story on how I decided to get married. <laughs> 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 Sky wasn't even supposed to be at my house that night. So she heard the gunshot and came to the door. So when she got to the door, she heard me struggling to get up the steps. Wow. And so she was like sitting there listening. So as soon as I got to the top of the steps, I remember hearing her voice say, who's there? So as soon as I heard her voice, I kind of like tried to clean up my voice a little bit. It's me. Like, <laughs> I was just like, it's me. I was like, open the door. And she was like, I can't see you. And I'm just like, I'm just sitting down. Just open the door. And she's like, well, I can't see you. And she's like, fucking open my fucking door. <laughs> so she opens the door, starts freaking out. I'm telling her, like, don't worry. Everything's cool. I got shot. And she starts asking questions. And I'm like, fucking call 911. I'm fucking dying. <laughs> and so she calls 911. And they, they basically, like, rushed me to Grady. I want to say the police officer was Cobb County. Um, was driving by my apartment complex and heard the gunshot. Right. And just like kind of started like coasting around waiting so for as the soon call. as the call came in he was like right there so he came walking up found the shell casing long story short uh they caught the guy a month later on the night that i found that sky was pregnant with kale wow uh, that's pretty epic and he was conceived the day before i got shot yeah he was, was. Right near valentine's day all right we all went out for valentine's dinner at uh at the Seren of Thailand. That that right there, the Seren of Thailand. That's right, which is epic. And so you left Psycho Tattoo. You went on to work someplace else. You know, obviously, you and I kept in in touch. And you know, many many years, like sixteen years now, you 
opened up your own shop to be closer to your mom in Carrollton, Georgia, which is where you are now. Skinworks is located in Carrollton. And a few weeks back, we talked about some of the issues you were having with your black mold and your slumlord you have been dealing with. Ben weighed in on some of, you know, those stats and whatnot. I pulled uh, some comps. Yeah, he did pull some comps, but I think it, and I hadn't sent them to you because I think at that point you had already found a different location, which you are still pursuing. Yes. Yeah. um, I've I've been doing a lot of research on a lot of stuff, but basically I am going for a commercial loan right now, which I, I assume that a commercial loan is a little, is a commercial loan different than a residential loan? much different. You've got a a number of different kinds of commercial loans. The best ones are through SBA, which is a small business administration, but they're also the most most difficult ones to get. Right. And so that's where we're looking at two options and the SBA is one of the options on the table. So we're going through that process right now, but I'm still in a location just carefully watching, making sure that the landlord is cashing my checks because I feel like as long as he cashes the checks, then I'm still... Yeah. He hasn't given you notice (laughs) yet though, but also... No, no. Has he been cashing your check? Has he cashed your check? Yes, he has. Okay. Yeah. So every so, month. Uh, that's nice. So here's another funny thing, because you guys drew up the contract. You and who was the fellow that you used? Bob Rose. When we came out here. Right. So in who, the contract. Who, let me add, is no longer with us anymore, unfortunately. Really? He, he died. And I just found out the other day, actually. It was, it was pretty sad. Rest in it. peace. Yes. Rest in peace, well, Bob Well, in Rhodes. his gift, because he basically put in that contract that I had to pay the first and last month's rent. So not only do I have the month that I paid rent that they cash a check for, but yeah. I still have a still standing last month rent right. with oh, them. Nice. So that literally gives me like 60 days play from the point of whenever he does give me that notice. Or whenever you <laughs> give him that notice. Hey, thanks for listening to the Man Fuse podcast. That was part one of our interview with tattoo artist Craig Foster. Join us tomorrow for part two as he gets into detail about his time on the hit TV show, Ink Master. Once again, thanks for listening.